Welcome to the Aquarimax Audio Show with Russ and Kelly. We provide information on all kinds of aquarium-related topics. This is episode 170, recorded July 6th, 2013. And today, Russ and I are very excited that we get to do another interview with Diana Wallstad. You guys remember we did one a while ago, and it was fabulous talking to her, so she has graciously agreed to join us again today, and in case you didn't hear the last one, I will tell you a little bit about her before we get started. Uh, Diana trained as a microbiologist and spent many years doing medical research at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her last position before she retired was as a cell biologist at the National Institute of Environmental Health Science. She's also a longtime aquarium hobbyist and published Ecology of the Planted Aquarium in 1999. This book has been translated into German, Italian, and Polish. Ooh, Russ, we should get it in Italian sometime. That would be cool. Recently, um, she published an e-book version of the Planted Aquarium book. So, without further ado, we would like to welcome Diana Wallstedt to uh, the Aquarimax Audio Show. And we're very happy to have her back with us again. Well, I'm very glad to be back. (laughs) Your last interview was very popular with our listeners. Yes. Uh, not surprisingly, of course, but okay. uh, we're, we're excited to have you back, and they are too. So, um, Kelly, why don't you start out with our first uh, question? Okay. Um, well, we're going to be talking with Diana about mycobacteriosis today. So give us an explanation of exactly what is mycobacteriosis. Okay. That is a mouthful, mycobacteriosis, but basically it's fish TB and... Um, Most people see it or recognize it as kind of a wasting disease where the bellies of their fish shrink up. However, that's only one symptom. uh, There are many symptoms that go unrecognized by hobbyists. It is a chronic disease. Um, it It is probably the most prevalent disease in the hobby. However, hobbyists don't recognize it and they're not aware of it. So they probably uh, misdiagnose it uh, as something else? Well, it's very hard to diagnose. Um, It certainly caught me by surprise. Um, I had fish, very, very healthy fish, that um, suddenly or gradually began to um, develop mouth sores. And I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way that I um, knew uh, and realized it was... um, mycobacteriosis was that I took the fish to a fish veterinarian and he diagnosed it as that disease. Mm. Yes. So um, hobbyists are not aware of it, um, but it, it um, is responsible probably for about a 50% of fish deaths. If your fish dies for no reason, it's probably, it, it could very well be due to mycobacteriosis. That's a pretty high number. Yes. It is. Now, uh, as I understand it, mycobacteriosis is caused by uh, bacteria, several species, quite a number of species of one genus, uh, mycobacterium genus. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. They are the, um, they're called environmental mycobacteria because they live in the environment. Um, They're, they can be found in water, soils, uh, hospital swimming pools, uh, drinking water, fish tanks, they're everywhere. And so wow. they are called environmental mycobacteria. And um, there is, uh, I guess that kind of leads to our next question. You hear a lot of terms. You hear the term mycobacteriosis. You hear fish TB. You hear piscine tuberculosis. And then, of course, when anyone hears the term tuberculosis, they, they think about the connection with human tuberculosis. So can you clarify all of that yeah. for us a little bit? Yes, I would be glad to. Um, mycobacteriosis is the scientific term for the disease. It is a disease of fish and reptiles. So frogs, toads, and snakes, they can get it as well. Um, disease of fish and reptiles. Um, Fish TB is mycobac- it's, it's mycobacteriosis in fish. And uh, piscine tuberculosis is just another fancy term for fish TB. Um, or, and this is always mycobacteriosis in fish. 
Now, human tuberculosis is totally different. Um, it's a human disease. It is caused by one species of bacterium. The name of that bacteria that causes human TB is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that's easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> Hard that's to forget. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's convenient. Mm. Um, the environmental mycobacteria that cause the fish TB, I'm going to um, use the term fish TB because we don't need to get that technical. <laughs> it's easier and, to say, right? <laughs> yeah, it's easier to say. It's just um, three syllables, not 20. <laughs> 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 So um, fish TB is caused by environmental mycobacteria, and they are in the same genus as the, the human TB, but they live in the environment. Many of the species, there are about 140 species, um, <clears throat> most of them are harmless. They just eat organic matter. But under certain circumstances, um, they become pathogenic to fish. And uh, in aquariums, that's one... Uh, environment where they often become pathogenic. Well, so the are there some species in the genus that never become pathogenic, or do all of them have the potential to do it? Uh, there are there are a few um, Mycobacterium smegmatis. I think is one that the scientists has have been using as a control for the virulent species. Um, there are a few, yes, that, that are totally non or Well, a pathogenicity is a relative term. If you're totally <laughs> immunocompromised, almost any bacteria will um, take advantage of the situation. But um, So it's a relative term. The ones that are the most pathogenic to fish are Mycobacterium marinum, and there's another hemophilum. I can't pronounce these these names, but there are there are about six that are. The scientists generally find these six routinely in fish that have died from the disease. So there's, those are the most virulent uh, species in the, in the genus, then. Yes. Okay. It, it's so, a sl- sliding scale. Okay. Okay. What seems to to make the mycobacteriosis, these different bacteria become pathogenic? Um, They become, um, they don't really become pathogenic. They just become a problem when they, there's large numbers of them in certain, certain environments encourage large numbers. Um, Ironically, it's um, clean tanks where people have disinfected tanks, um, and what happens is they kill all the ordinary, well, the environmental bacteria, mycobacteria, are extremely resistant to antibiotics, disinfectants, Clorox, etc. Mm-hmm. So when people, aquarium hobbyists, um, treat their tanks with antibiotics or they disinfect the tanks, what they're doing is killing off other bacteria, and the mycobacteria um, they they thrive under those conditions because they don't have any competition now. Oh. So, so there basically is, what happens when, when humans often take antibiotics, they, they lose their, their beneficial gut flora, yeah. and then they can become immunocompromised, and the same sort of thing is happening in an aquarium? Yes. Very okay. good. Yeah, I like that analogy. <laughs> yeah. Do they have it, probiotics for fish? Yes, they do. Um, some of the aquaculture farms do use probiotics. Um, oh. I think it's been found to be beneficial. Yep, That's pretty cool. There are even some hobbyist uh, foods that now include probiotics. Oh. Yeah. I think Cobalt Blue makes one, and I think Hikari makes one. Mm-hmm. So they're out there now for hobbyist use. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good idea. You um, feel, okay, the... Um, intestines with bacteria that are beneficial so that the pathogens don't have attachment sites and uh, yeah it's good they kind of outcompete them so they don't become a problem yes that's true and some of the um, human diseases uh, C. Diffic- Clostridium difficile 
uh, that happens. People get that disease. It can be very serious um, after they've taken antibiotics. If they take antibiotics, they will get some of these diseases because um, these pathogens can now, they don't have any competition, so they've got a free ride, and they can um, multiply to numbers that now become a problem. I see. So the pathogenicity of mycobacteriosis is, is mainly a numbers game. It's not the virulence per se of the species. It is the numbers of the of the bacteria, how many there are in the tank. Um, it's is the fish <clears throat> immune, or is it um, does it have full immunity, or is it is is its immunity weakened? Um, by trauma or something like that. So a lot of fish that have, um, once they've been shipped to, you know, they're shipped from the wholesalers and to the aquarium store, and then they get in the hobbyist tank. I mean, they've gone through several weeks of stress, and their immune systems are lowered, and they're now very vulnerable to mycobacteriosis. So Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it does. Poor fishies. <laughs> the, the, what, yeah, poor fishies is right. <laughs> yeah, it's tough being a, a new fish in a new tank. It is. Yeah. Now, you, you've mentioned a couple of the characteristics of, of mycobacteria that make them so challenging to deal with, uh, one being that they, they're really resistant to disinfectants and to antibiotics. What are some of their other characteristics that make them difficult to deal with? Well, um, they're impossible to treat. So you, uh, for fish, I mean, you, you, there's no antibiotic that, that will kill them so, or kill them when they're in a fish. So it's an untreatable disease. And um, the other thing is that it's unrecognized. I mean, a fish can look perfectly normal and be carrying it, and then when that fish is brought into a new tank, the other the other fish are, you know, maybe totally susceptible. So the problem is, is that you can't see the disease. Um, you don't even know necessarily that it's in the tank. Yeah. See, that's what happened to me. I bought these beautiful new rainbow fish, and they looked great. And six months later, um, my other fish started having problems. So because the rainbow fish were carrying it, I I think so. <laughs> it's hard to say, but I I do know that the other rainbow fish had the the um, mycobac. They were diagnosed with it, so they had it. Where they, you know, I'm pretty sure they got it from the new fish, but I'm not absolutely sure. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to to track. That's that's the problem. You just it's hard. It's a very slow disease. It might take uh, months or years to manifest itself. So people, you know, they don't recognize it. They bring a new fish home, it looks okay, but then it dies three months later, and they say, hey, what happened? Right. And they just, yeah, and that happens over and over again, and hobbyists, they're, you know, they're just not a, really aware of it. And you, you can't really treat it prophylactically because you can't treat it at all. No, that's true. In terms of... Yeah, you can't use an antibiotic that would be a prophylaxis, so no. another complication there. Yeah. So really the only way to deal with it is preventative. Yes. Yes. Uh, care- very careful quarantining and um, some other techniques that I guess we'll talk about later. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to get into those now, Russ, or did you have another see. question first? Well, um, Well. L- let's let's talk about the... Steps that we can take uh, to prevent our fish from becoming victims These of preventative steps. Yeah, the yeah. preventative steps. Let's, Let's do go it ahead now. and talk about that now. Okay. Yeah, that's always the best. Well, um, I mentioned quarantining. Um, that's very important. Um, I'm, I'm, I also might want to say that um, the um, some of the ideas that I've gotten have come from the breeding of zebrafish for um, scientific studies. There are, about, there are hundreds of labs in the country that do scientific studies using zebrafish. And lo and behold, um, the main problem, they, these breeding 
fish breeding facilities have is mycobacteriosis. And so um, that's their main disease that they have problems with. And um, so they have um, described steps that will help um, prevent the problem or, or deal or manage the problem. And um, they agree with, with uh, me. <laughs> I agree with them. <laughs> I hate to say it. Um, first, a UV sterilizer is a big help because it, uh, that's what I, um, what I brought, how I brought my um, fish TB outbreak under control is a UV sterilizer. It kills the bacteria in the water, and that includes the mycobacteria. That oh, that's it. nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a great tool. Yeah, at least something will kill them, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, UV light is very powerful for killing these bacteria. And um, on your advice on our last interview, I went ahead and purchased one, and I've installed it, and oh. I love it. Great. Okay. So, yeah. You know, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I was just going to say, uh, I hadn't had a lot of recent problems with it when... Uh, by that time, but uh-huh. I was I was worried about it occurring again, and I've had it. And since installing that, it's it's been really great. Um, my fish up here be doing very well. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I think it's especially important um, in a quarantine tank when you have new fish. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it, that it, makes it, a lot of sense. Yeah, the fish are very vulnerable. New fish are very vulnerable, and. Um, to whatever's in the tank, and if you can kind of clean up the if you can clean up the water with the UV sterilizer, that gives them a little breathing, a little bit of time to develop um, immunity and kind of get get settled in. Right. Um, the other thing is um, the micro environmental mycobacteria that cause fish TB. Um, they are very uh, fatty like, and so it flo- they float to the surface of the water. And um, so I always, when I'm cleaning the tank, the number one thing I do is remo- remove any surface biofilms, that kind of sticky goo at the top. Right. Uh, yeah, and the other reason it's important to remove it is that if your fish feed at the surface, like mine do, like my rainbow fish, or if you have, a, you know, betas and other fish that feed at the surface, um, in, uh, ingesting the food is the way fish get infected. That's the route of infection. It's not through the gills um, or, you know, through the skin. It's when they eat, they ingest the mycobacteria. And if you've got a a big scum on the surface of your tank filled with mycobacteria and, they're, and the fish are eating at the surface, uh, that's a disaster. Yeah, that's not, ma- not a good equation. Yeah. yeah, so that um, micro, the environmental mycobacteria, they do, um, they they have a fatty um, kind of coating and or cell wall. They have a fatty cell wall and it makes them like fat, and they float to the surface. And that fatty um, wall is why they are so um, resistant to antibiotics and Clorox. The Clorox and antibiotics just can't get in through that fat oh. layer. Have a lipid-based armor. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's um, the whole key to the mycobacteria is is that lipid layer. In fact, that's where their name comes from. It's um, mycolipids, or their cell wall is made out of mycolipids and oh, oh, I'm sorry, mycolic acids. <laughs> And these are strange lipids that um, these bacteria that characterize this bacteria. So, what's the best technique for getting that scum off the surface of the water? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I tried putting um, pieces of paper on the surface and letting it suck up the scum, but the easiest thing I do I have a pitcher, um, a pitcher, and I just um, when I'm doing a water change, I just, you know, I don't know how, how you skim it, just skim it off the surface with oh. that um, that cup or whatever that I'm using. And I just, when I change the water, I, I just remove it from the top. I get that scum as I change the water. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the way I do it. Just take to know. Yeah. And I've <laughs> also noticed that uh, if you have a filter that causes some surface turbulence, that tends to break up the scum and kind of help it uh, uh, help avoiding yeah. help it to avoid being formed. Yes. Yes. To some that's. Degree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, defi- that's definitely another help. And the other there, thing... There are even some filters out there. I know Doctors Foster and Smith has a filter with a built-in surface skimmer, so it pulls water off the surface down into the, the intake under the surface and then pulls it up through the filter. I've never tried one, but I think that might be of some help, too. Yes, the, the only problem with that is that it's just going to um, shoot the bacteria into the water... So mm, that uh, makes sense. It could be an issue. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, if they if they tend to float, if you can get them to float up to the top and then take them off, is that better than stirring it's them? It's better back than in? yeah. It's better than, because the fish aren't eating them at the, eating them at the surface when they're eating their flake food or whatever. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It would help. Um, the best thing would be um, to have a skimmer hooked up to a U and then have it go through a UV filter. Oh yeah. That, oh yeah, that'd be good. That would be the ultimate. Um, the other thing, I'm glad you mentioned this about the skimmers because if you have salt water um, and use a protein skimmer, that's a great way to remove the mycobacteria because um, the surface biofilm and the, all those nasty mycobacteria are, um, you know, skimmed off the surface and then they're discarded. Right, you just take the collection cup and get rid of all sorts of mycobacterium every time. That's right. Yeah, that yeah. that's yeah for salt. It, that works in saltwater tanks. It's but, too bad uh, that uh, fresh water is not viscous enough for skimmers like that. Yeah, to work protein yeah, <laughs> it's too bad. Maybe somebody <laughs> needs to invent a freshwater skimmer, huh? Yeah, protein I don't know how skimmer. they would do that because they yeah. don't you have do it. You invent it. You got all kinds of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean that'll that will reduce the the numbers having a UV sterilizer and then keeping the scums off of the surface. Okay, and so then those are probably like main lines of defense. Yes, I would say that. And oh, the other, of course, um, monitoring the fish, good quarantine. Um, uh, when I say monitoring the fish, I mean if you see a fish that uh, has a shrunken belly or is not behaving well, get it into another tank. Um, just you know. C- culling, controlling, okay. uh, you know, getting yeah, getting a, the pathogens. Because Get away the, from the other fish as soon as you can. Yeah, be, because the fish is the main, once the fish is infected, it becomes a huge reservoir of of these bacteria. And, the, and as I said, the more back of these bacteria you have, the, the worse it is. The and other... If um, the fish is symptomatic, yeah. would you just recommend uh, humanely, humanely euthanizing it? Yeah. Yeah. I usually, I usually do. I, yeah, that's what I. You can't done too, heal yeah. them, right? I mean, there's nothing that's going to fix it. There's nothing that's going to fix it. Right. I mean, that's, it, that's what I ended up doing because my rainbow fish were exhibiting symptoms a couple of years ago, and uh, when everyone became symptomatic, that's what I did. I just didn't want to endanger yeah. all the other fish. Yeah. So. You really, you, you, yes. That's what I do. Is and that's, it's. Part of being a good fish keeper, I think, is is culling. You just right. have to do it to keep, the, keep the system healthy. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of yeah, yeah. It, it's part of being a good fish keeper. The other thing um, on the quarantine, um, it doesn't do any good just to um, <clears throat> buy a new fish and then put it in a tank, a quarantine tank for three months because that fish could be infected, and um, when you put it in your tank, even after three months, it, it can still infect the others. So um, what it, I recommend and what um, the scientists strongly recommend is using a sentinel fish, and what they do is, um, in their fish breeding facilities, the water that comes, see, they have, a, they have the quarantine tank with the new fish, and then um, the water from that tank flows into um, a tank with a sentinel fish, and that's a, um, a, a canary-in-the-coal-mine fish. 
And that mm-hmm. fish um, will become sick if the, the if the new fish is sick. If, you, uh, if he's carrying it, it'll make the other fish sick, and then you know not to put it in your main tank. Right. Okay. So Makes sense yeah. that you are, in effect, sacrificing that one fish to preserve the health of all the other fish in your system. Exactly. Yeah, um, because when, yeah, if if you, you know, just buy a new fish and put it in a quarantine tank, a lot of times, you know, these fish with that are infected with mycobacteria, they won't show it. They they have enough immunity themselves that they can carry it for years without showing any symptoms. But um, if you put a fish with them that has doesn't have the disease and has no immunity to it, it won't have any immunity to the mycobacteria because it's it doesn't have the disease, so it's a right. sitting duck, and it will show the infection very quick. You know, much you know within probably a few weeks. So and that does make sense, especially yeah. if you have a a, a big system and and you know that uh, you're running a risk by placing this new potentially infected fish in. That's yeah. It's a lot better to lose that one sentinel fish. Yeah, and there's the chances are you might not lose the fish if if the new fish is isn't sick, your sentinel will be fine. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's it's a potential risk, but it's not necessarily one. Yeah. It's not necessarily a problem. Right. You yeah, you're those. you're right. Um you understand. So um yeah, the problem yeah, the main problem with with fish TB is that you can't see it. And you know, and not everybody is willing to sacrifice. You know, take their fish to a veterinarian, and the easiest way is to quarantine it with a sentinel fish and just monitor what happens. Okay. Right. Um, and we talked about the difference between you know fish TB and human TB. Can fish TB be transmitted to humans? Yes, it can. Um, Thank you for asking. This is, um, unfortunately, a lot of hobbyists don't know that they can get um, small the sewers, which are, you know, very kind of bad sewers on their hands and arms from cleaning out their tanks. And what happens is if um, the hobbyist has a small skin break, um, the environmental mycobacteria can get in and start in a skin infection. And uh, this condition is called fish tank granuloma and uh the sewers don't heal it takes a long long time for them to heal and they're kind of pustules and the problem is is that many medical doctors they don't recognize it for what it is mm-hmm. uh fish tank granuloma and uh I'll I'll just give you one um story it's a true story <clears throat> one of the um officers in the local aquarium club she got this sore on her finger that just wouldn't go away and it became kind of debilitating on the on the finger she went to her doctor and he he recommended surgery and so Mm. she was scheduled yeah to have this you know a kind of hideous sore removed and um in the meantime she talked to one of her fellow hot you know a hobbyist and he said you know, wait a minute, this could be fish tank granuloma. Um, Why don't you, you know, let your doctor talk to a fish veterinarian? And so that's what happened. Um, The the fish vet and the medical doctor got together, and and the medical doctor realized that what he was dealing with, fish tank granuloma. um, What did they do to treat it after that? Okay, well, they canceled the surgery and uh, oh, treated good. <laughs> and then they um she went on a course of antibiotics, which um it, it's a little bit difficult, but it does work, and she was able yeah it it healed by itself with the antibiotic That's treatment kind of scary it is, and um yeah, a lot of people uh, you know aquarium uh, many most aquarium hobbies, even once in the aquarium society, they didn't. We're, we're not aware of this disease, right. and then they go, go to their doctors, and the doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. And uh, I just think that anybody who has a fish tank ought to be at least know about it. Definitely, yeah. 
And um, the other thing I, I would say is that the the tank doesn't can look normal. This woman who had it, her tanks were all looked fine. You know, they were mm-hmm. normal They're and still in the water. Exactly. Waiting. Yeah, waiting for it. And it was <laughs> just yeah. She just had a sliver. It was just a little pinprick. Was how the um, it was just enough to break the skin and let those bacteria in. Wow. So another um, good reason to wear aquari- aquarium gloves when you're working in your tanks. Yeah, I, I tried that, but oh, it was pretty. I didn't. Are, are they? Have do you use them or? I do actually. Yeah. Oh. I stick my hands in my tanks so much that I I got some that are they go up almost to my shoulders. Okay. And they're. Uh, big rubber gloves, so I imagine that would be a pretty good protection. Yes, are, if they're those purple ones, they're very thick. These uh, are red and blue. I don't know what the purple ones are, but okay, maybe they're a different brand. These, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure they're. Uh, yeah, I, I got some, and and I found it really hard to use them. What I do is is if I've been working in the tank, um, I soap up within 30 minutes of working in the tank. I, I just wash my hands and arms really carefully. Okay. Yeah. I, I, normal hygiene, you know, you're touching your tank, wash your hands. Exactly, yeah. I, I, just, I also usually do that, and I will often follow up with some hand sanitizer. I've heard that they're more vulnerable, the microbacterium are more vulnerable to alcohol in high concentrations, I think over 60%, than they are to a lot of other disinfectants. Yes, that's true because of the lipid. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah. The best disinfectant is is um, some kind of alcohol, seventy percent isopropanol or any kind of alcohol because it because of the lipid solute. Yeah, you're right. That's much better than Clorox. If you're st- I also have got some seventy uh, percent isopropyl alcohol for that purpose. If I need to sterilize, uh, you know, pruning scissors or something, I use that. Yes. Yeah, that's that's very good. That that's much. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you seem to have read up on this quite a bit. <laughs> well, th- thanks to you. <laughs> I started with your article, uh, your original article, and uh, I I continue to do some research from there. Okay, good. Good. And that kind of brings us to our next uh, point. Uh, we 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 know that you have a new workout on mycobacteriosis and. We'd like to ask you to um, direct our listeners to it. How can they? How can they access that? Well, my article I wrote it in 2009, and I've, I updated it this year. As much as I well, I, I updated it, so it's on my um, my book's website. And okay, and we're going to put that link. Yeah, up, we'll right? put that link up. On yeah, it. I don't. <laughs> It's a long link, so um, right. but but it's but the same pe- one that you gave us last time, right? Yeah, it's the same one, except I did revise it this year. Okay, okay. but I mean the link is the same, so yeah. we can put the same link on on our uh, website, and then people can go directly to it and see your new updated article. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure yeah, they, they will be happy to do that. Yeah. 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 Um, oh. yeah. Oh, go ahead. No. Uh oh, did we lose you? No, no. I was just I, the only thing I was going to say is that um, the zebrafish facilities um, they are continuing to work on this problem, and um, their findings are very germane to the aquarium hobby. And you know, it's it's solid information. And I do have a in my new um, update revise revision. I have a few new references from the zebrafish. Facilities. Oh, oh yeah. great! Yeah, that would be yeah. some great follow-up information. Yeah, it's um, Michael Kent and um, Harif. See, no, it's Whips. Qu- Qu- Whips. He wrote an article in 2012, and then Michael Kent wrote one in 2009. And those are those go into kind of the things that people can do to protect their tanks. Okay, that would be really helpful. Yeah. In fact, I think I've read one of those. Oh, oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's um, good. Makes sense. You did your homework. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've also um, 
written an article on human tuberculosis. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a family story. My grandmother died of it when she was um, just 27 years old. She oh. left my mother mo- motherless, essentially. Wow. And so, it, yeah, it, it had a big impact on my family. Yeah. So, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I wrote a, a long article on human tuberculosis and got a little bit into the science, but the other part of it is kind of a biography um, explaining how the disease affected my my uh, ancestors. Well, that would be really interesting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that available too? Yes. Uh huh. That's on um, my WordPress website at. Um, dwalstead.com you know I can, okay. I can give it to you later as a link yeah, yeah so we can yeah, put that one up too if you could send that to us then we'd, uh, okay. we could post it as well yeah I'm going to I'm I'm going to be working on revising that um, from time to time as well as the one on mycobacteriosis um, okay good it's always nice to have those uh, as current as possible as new mm-hmm. new information yeah. comes to light and uh, also I, I invite um your listeners, um, if they have any comments or suggestions, um, have them write to me. I'd love to hear, you know, if they have any suggestions or new information or, or what. And uh, you have contact information on your website that they can access? Yes. Yeah. Great. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. So you heard it, folks. Right <laughs> uh, I've oh, opened the floodgate. I wanted to something else, too. Uh, Diane is uh, very well known in the hobby for her book, Ecology of the Planet Aquarium, and a new digital edition has come out, which I announced in our last podcast, but I might as well announce it again uh, since we're talking to her right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is available on your website as well. Is that right? Yes, and also Amazon.com, iTunes. I think Amazon is selling it for about $10. Wow. Oh, that's a good yeah. deal. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they're... Very good deal. So, if yes. you've been uh, interested in getting the book, but uh, you couldn't find it for $10, now you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amazon is undercutting the price to sell their Kindles, I think. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that all of our questions? I, that we were I think go that through? covers all of our questions. Anything else that you wanted to uh, mention, Diana? No, I think I'm a I'm about out of breath here. <laughs> yeah. No, I um I just encourage people to go to my article. It's a 10 pages long and has a lot of scientific information and references um and it also describes what happened to me. Um I mean my fish <laughs> and what right. a trauma it was to um go through that disease. I I thought I would have to tear down all my tanks. But um I ended up not having to do that. Just I learned how to manage the disease. Right, and, and that's really the best we can do at this point, isn't it? Yes, it is. And even the the zebrafish people, the scientists kind of came to that conclusion. If they had a very virulent um, EM, they would have to, you know, nuke everything and tear down the facility. But if it was kind of a, um, a low-level... Uh, pathogen. They they just learned how to deal with it because when they tried to, you know, set up sterilized colonies of zebrafish and, you know, have them free of um, the mycobacteria totally, it just never worked. Within a few months, um, the mycobacteria were back in the water. So mm. it, it's, you know, you just can't get rid of it. It's there. I think that's a great point because I've heard and seen on forums and so on, people will say, well, you can never really get rid of uh, mycobacteria, which is, of course, true, but that means that if you've ever had an infection, you should never use that tank again or something like that. Uh, but I don't think that's true. Um, it just means that you have to, as you mentioned, you have to manage the disease. Right. Make sure you're taking all the steps to prevent it from becoming... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, bacteria. the dominant bacteria. If you take all the steps we talked about, like uh, managing the surface scum and using UV sterilization, you can keep it from becoming an issue, but you can never really completely eliminate them from the system. 
That is true. That's and you can that. have tanks that have been completely healthy for years and remain completely healthy, and they probably have some degree of EM oh, yeah. in there. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. There's no way to get rid of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, that's, I'm glad that uh, you're confirming what I was sus- suspecting. Yes, <laughs> I agree people, with you totally. <laughs> uh, some people have, have gone to the extent of saying, I'm... I'm I'm going to get rid of all my tanks and I'll start over, you know, at That's some point. But I I just I can't use these tanks anymore because they've had it in there anymore. But as soon as they set up another tank, they're going to have it in there again. So it's pointless right. to go from that direction. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Even the zebrafish people. I mean, they they started with sterilized egg, they sterilized eggs and sterilized the tanks, and within a few months, um, the fish had. You know, I mean, they weren't diseased, but they had there were mycobacteria in the tank, and right. as I said, many of the mycobac the environmental mycobacteria are totally non non virulent. Right. Well, uh-huh. I think we've gotten a good grip on this. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for uh, being willing to come on our show again. Okay. Well, uh, I'm very. We- very happy to have been here. I think um, this disease is important. It, it's, you know, it makes knowing how to take combat it can make the hobby a lot more more fun. Right, right. And I think this is it's great that you have been willing to to share your experience in an informative way that can help a lot of hobbyists avoid issues and um, understand it and kind of break down some of the myths that surround. Uh, mycobacteriosis. So we're really grateful for that, and I'm sure our listeners are too. And as okay. always, you are a delight to talk to. All right. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, and hopefully we'll talk to you again in the future. Okay. Very good, Russ. Russ and Kelly, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. thank you for listening to this edition of the Aquarimax Audio Show. For additional episodes, please visit Aquarimax.com. For comments and or questions that may be featured on an upcoming podcast, leave a message at 801-477-0629 or email us at info at aquarimax.com.